the pride of life, and to help us do that and to understand God's message about how to control pride in our lives, we have a special guest, Mr. Stan Isbell. Stan, welcome to the program, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Mark. It's wonderful to be back. Appreciate you having me here. You know, we've been talking quite a bit now about 1 John chapter 2, uh, focusing around verse 16. And as we bring our thoughts to a conclusion today, I think we ought to take another look at those verses and focus in mm -hmm. on the specific subject for today, the pride of life. In 1 John 2, starting at verse 15, we read these words. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So Stan, you and I have been talking about how these, this phrase, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and those three phrases are encapsulated all of the evils that we see in the world around us. They really are, uh, Mark. These are like three channels uh, in which a person, which we can put all sin, all of our social uh, ills and evils that we experience around us, uh, crime, uh, you know, from personal uh, weaknesses and uh, where we fail in our, in, through temptation and sin, all the way up to relationships, uh, broken homes, broken marriages, broken relationships, lost jobs. Uh, it all falls into the category of these three channels, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And, and really, as we have looked back or as we have gone over in our previous classes or, or uh, sessions, we have seen that the uh, it's like the story that I told in the first uh, class or first session was that the, there was a tree that seems to uh, uh, be a parable of all of our social ills. And better, better is a man digging at the roots of a problem than a thousand men hacking at the branches. And that's really what the Bible is, is a road map taking us back to our origins. And Genesis is the seedbed of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So we've gone back to Genesis to see where the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, entered into our species, our race. And we have gone back to Genesis, and we might just turn, turn back there for a moment to see how that uh, God had created the earth and he created Adam and Eve and put them in a garden, gave them one law not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he also created a serpent that was very good. It did have the uh, voice of expression, expressing its own carnal mind. It was an animal mind, but it nonetheless was able to observe. It was called the most subtle beast, more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. That's Genesis 3, verse 1. Mm -hmm. So the serpent suggested to Eve that she wouldn't die after God had given them commandment that they would die if they ate of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And as you said to us before, the, the first lie right. that, has, uh, that, that we have recorded for us. And that's very important because our desires now, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are very deceitful. The heart of man is deceitful above all things, Jeremiah 17, 9. So we are under a delusion because of our makeup as well as because of our environment, we make a facade and we tend to believe it. And a lot of times these false assumptions can get us into great difficulty and conflict with ourselves personally, our own integrity, as well as our relationships. But it's interesting to note in verse 6 of chapter 3 in Genesis, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, so immediately her eyes are engaged upon the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. So we have seen that here is where the serpent's lie brought Eve into this idea because he told her in verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he put this thought in her mind. And so when she saw that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise, she thought, well, you know, the serpent's got a good idea and employed her own desires and her own thoughts to be wise as the gods, having her eyes open. And so today, that applies to us in a number of ways. We want to be wise, but there are really two forms of wisdom the Bible talks about, a worldly wisdom or sophistication and a godly wisdom. And really, those two have nothing in common. 
the godly wisdom comes from heeding the word of God and obeying it and applying it to our moral character so that we can develop. Now, there is a framework we showed in, in our first session. Uh, before, before you run off to that one, okay. um, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves here because right. I think an important message that came out in our very first class mm -hmm. was the authority of God right. and the fact that that authority is revealed to us through His Scriptures. Right. So we have the authority of God and the authority of His Word. Mm -hmm. So as we're thinking about these things, um, in 1 John 2, it was framed up as the things of the world and the things... Of, of God, right. just as you've helped us understand those as the worldly wisdom and the godly wisdom, those, those two, if you will, opposing way of points of view. And so um, when, we, when we had those and we established the author authority of God and authority of his word, mm -hmm. then we talked about then specifically the lust of the flesh. Right. And it was in the lust of the flesh that we had the, the framework for thinking about how do we go about understanding that. So why don't you take us into your, Good point. your triangle at this point. Good point. point. We did. We, we have gone through the lust of the eyes, now the lust of the flesh, because it's in the flesh where the motions of sin are really engaged, as Paul brings out in Romans chapter 5. And Romans brings out all of this uh, battle within Paul. And what, what we want to supply the viewer is a way, a process to show them how this really works. Right. I mean, if it can work for me, and we've seen a little bit of my past, it can work for anyone. And that's the most important thing. There is a process. Don't just tell people, be good, be good, be good. Show them how they can be good. So there's a process in getting to that framework. This, this little pyramid of the framework shows us that thought, the mental aspect of a person, is where you have to return. You can't just have a, a, a desire. You can't just be moved by the religious experience of emotion, no matter how godly you might think you feel at the time, those feelings are subject to change in the uh, in the next trial that you face tomorrow after the religious service is over, and you're right, not amongst right. your religious peers. So you have to get back to the thought. That's why God gave us a literary power in the Word. It is inspired, uh, and, it, and it's perfect, and it's to well equip us against the battle of sin, as Paul tells us in Timothy. So. A top of, uh, on top of that level of thought are feelings, and our feelings can be disciplined and controlled by thinking and understanding according to the way of God. We raise our thinking to his thinking, therefore our ways get raised to his ways, and we become sons and daughters enabling uh, are able to act more like Jesus Christ. And, if, and, if, and I think the point here is to help us make this very personal, is, mm -hmm. is we're thinking about how do we change? Right. How do I change from acting the way that I do, which is wrong, which is not in accord with God's will, to a way that is in accord with His will? So this framework for change is re helping us recognize that if, if we'll change the way we think right. by filling our minds with the Word of God, that'll help us then yeah. change our feelings, which will lead to a change in character, right. which will lead to a change in behavior or conduct, as your chart says. And that's really the glory of God in our life. That's the glory, the moral excellence of God is seen in our lives because it's His Word, it's our desire to submit and obey. Therefore, our character changes to be more like Christ. Right. It is a behavior modification of the highest order. You know, faith is the highest form of intellectual reasoning that a human being can ever experience, bar none. All the wisdom in the world, all the degrees in nuclear science and medicine and whatever, it, it doesn't hold a, can a candle to faith that comes by hearing the Word of God in an, in, a, in an accurate way. It's really important. So our conduct, like you say, is the pinnacle, the summit that people see around us, and especially under pressure. It's always easy right. to be good when you're amongst good people. But when we're by ourselves and we're put under pressure of traffic, freeways, working up our income tax, whatever, are we going to be honest and, and, and people of integrity? So, so let's let's mm -hmm. let's dive into at this point then the specifics of our discussion today of the pride yeah. of life. Okay, because uh, that gives us a good background, summarizes what we've done in the previous classes, mm -hmm. and what we want to focus in now. And what's the Bible's point of view on the pride of life? What is what's that mean? And what's kind of some of the principles that we should understand as we think of those phrases? Well, if you stop and think about it, Mark, pride is really believing that we are somewhere that we really aren't. Okay, or that we are someone that we're really not. I heard one fellow at work the other day say, um, it's okay to be lost. And then we all looked at him and thought, what do you mean it's okay to be lost? 
And he said, the more dangerous situation is believing you're somewhere that you're not. Okay. <laughs> the best case scenario is knowing exactly where you are. And that's really what the Word of God does. It maps us, it maps out humanity from the beginning to today and on to the, to the great goal of God filling the earth with His glory. And that's where we want to be. But we need to know exactly where we are and not in a state of delusion of believing that we're somewhere that we're not. If we're lost, let's admit it, that gives us the impetus to search out the where we are. Sure. So let's, let's start by turning to uh, Matthew 10 and verse 16. I think it's a, a very important verse in light of what I said earlier about two types of wisdom and that the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, as we read, um, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. These are Jesus' words. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. I'm going to ask you to read out of the RSV, continuing with verse 18. So start picking it up at verse 18. And mm -hmm. you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear testimony before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you up, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not your, you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Good. Now, this is the whole point that we are faced with. The disciples were to go out and be as wise as serpents. Well, the serpent back in Genesis was subtle. And that's right. the same word, basically, uh, corresponding to the New Testament Greek word, uh, as wise as serpent, but harmless as doves. And that means being discreet, careful, cautious, knowing what you believe, observing as the serpent did, and he, his characteristics were really good in that sense. Now, he misused them in becoming mm -hmm. the father of the lie when he said, you shall not surely die. But Jesus picks up that, that uh, account back in Genesis, brings it forward, says, and he applies that characteristics, a characteristic to his disciples. Now, he tells them that you're going to be drawn before men in authority. And, you know, we fear men in authority in the sense we want to be respected and accepted by them. We don't want to be rejected right. by men in authority, the scientists, the all-wise, the uh, intelligentsia of our environment today. We're embarrassed to be called a fool by these men who are considered to be the wise. Jesus said, you're going to have to face that rejection because if you're of my followers, they're going to look at you as a fool they're going to look at me as a fool. They're going to reject me. They're going to crucify me. And you're going to have to follow, take up your cross and follow me. So being rejected by people who say, you know, you're a fool if you don't believe in evolution. But actually, more and more scientists are beginning to recognize that we were a created species from a higher intelligent form of life. Superior, far superior in intelligence. So as we see that uh, Jesus gives us a great comfort and hope in this being wise as serpents and not wise as the world. Right. You know? And I think there's an important message here, and that is um, that we are to use our intelligence to do this. Right. It's not, uh, many will talk about following along in blind faith. You mm -hmm. mentioned earlier how important faith is. Right. But it's not that we are supposed to just blindly believe that um, there's things we should do. We're supposed to do that with the God-given intelligence and oh, yes. uh, ability to reason that, um, that, that each of us have. It's a very important one because a lot of people are under the idea that Bible-educated people are rather ignorant. They're sort of depending on this crutch and that they really aren't intelligent uh -huh. as opposed to the intelligence of the universities and the institutions of higher learning. But that is a delusion. And the delusion it is very evident as you get into what the odds are of perhaps amino acids lining up at random to create the first uh, hemoglobin protein, right? You know, the, the odds are, are said to be 1 in 10 to the 850th power. Now, that's a huge number. And it's staggering. It's staggering. staggering. You can't even imagine it. You're, oh, you're getting into the realm of infinity because the universe itself only has 10 to the 80th power atoms mm -hmm. in the whole universe. So you're looking at odds that are astronomical and, and, and impossible for that sort of lining up of amino acids. And the same thing applies and, yeah. to DNA. I mean, they've just recently mapped the DNA 
of, of, of a human being, the DNA of a microorganism, for it to come about, would actually be one in seven, one to ten to seventy-eight thousandth power. Wow! Now that tells you something that we have not evolved, but rather have been created. But anyway, I didn't mean to get off on the tangent. No, I understand. We got to got to keep moving. Yeah, Let's turn to Romans chapter twelve, mm -hmm. uh, looking at verses one through three, and I think there's uh, some thoughts. That's a that very good verse. We wanted really to bring is. in. Yep. Let's do that. Romans chapter twelve. I'll read it from the Revised Standard Version. I think that, that expresses it well. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I bid every one among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned him. That's very important. And this, this really cuts to the heart of this thought of the pride of life, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It does. It really does. This, a man's uh, attitude towards his fellow man is really governed by his attitude towards God. If he has a wonderful relationship with God, he walks humbly before his God. He yeah. does justly. He looks for equity. He looks for fairness. He recognizes, therefore, the grace of God go I. And so he treats his fellow man with the fear of God in his mind, knowing that forgive him his debts, even as God has forgiven us our debts. So there's a wonderful relationship that brings society together, regardless of race, sex, creed, whatever. It's important that we treat our fellow men uh, the way God would want us to, and as he has treated us with great grace and forgiveness. There's a couple of verses in Proverbs mm -hmm. that... Um, I think are really useful for us just to kind of finalize our thoughts on sure. the Bible's point of view about the pride of life. And let's look at those together. Let's uh, take a look at Proverbs 16, verse 18. Mm -hmm. And this is a phrase that I think um, many of us have heard before. Good um, one. Maybe yeah. didn't even realize that it came out of the Bible. Right. But uh, looking at verse 18 of Proverbs 16, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. Good verse. Why don't you read it from the King James Version just to help yes. us with the familiar words. It says, Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. And, and, and that is a difficult thing for us because we seem to want to raise ourselves with some sort of an advantage that our fellow man can look at us and say, Wow, I sure would like to be like Mike or like him. And therefore, we tend to raise ourselves, but it's really an illusion. And we tend to keep wanting to raise ourselves. But God tells us, stay down there with the lowly because that's who really depends on me. They don't depend on their own self-conceit. Be not wise in your own conceits is what Paul tells us in Romans. Another so, one in Proverbs, isn't it? Yeah, we're going to go to Proverbs 29. Let's look quickly there at verse mm -hmm. 23. Okay. Same, same concept and keeping in mind that what we're looking for here is the Bible's point of view. What does the Bible say about pride of life? It's, right. This is, will, if you will, the what, and just shortly we'll look at the so what. What do yes, we do about this? That's good. So the what here, Proverbs 29, verse 23, a man's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Oh, that's great. That's really great. I mean, it's, it's difficult to be humble, but God knows how to bring us down if we tend to raise ourselves up into being someone who we think we are, and we're really not. We're, we're still living in that delusion. So let's condensate ourselves, so to speak, down to the level of, of the truth and of who we really are. And we really need to take God's word on that, don't we? Uh, another one in Proverbs 11, I think, is a, is a good one, verse 2. Uh, Why don't you read that for us, and mm -hmm. then we'll, we'll move on to Philippians from there. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. It goes right back to that very real wisdom, that genuine wisdom of knowing the moral character of God and trying to apply it in our life, which is what Jesus did. And I think that's where you wanted to go to in, in, in Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, because what we've been talking about so far is, um, if you will, it's a lot of words about what does the Bible say about pride and, and the danger of it. Right. And now, really, we want to make it personal. So what do we do? How do we change? What do we change to mm -hmm. to deal with pride in our lives? 
And I think there's a there's a series of verses here in Philippians 2. Um, I would encourage our listeners to read this on their own, starting at verse 1 all the way through the end of the chapter. Right. Uh, but we'll focus in on uh, some of the early part of the chapter here. In verse um, 3, as an example, says, Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others, others better than yourself. Yeah. And so we have the beginnings now of, of God through His Word telling us how we ought to behave. We ought to exactly. behave counting others better than ourselves. In mm-hmm. verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Mm-hmm. So that um, continues on that same thought, that pride no longer um, is part of our lives. And the way we do that is we take pains to look after and take care of and to treat others better than ourselves first. Exactly. That, that is really seeking another's welfare. It's really sacrificing ourselves for someone else, which is exactly what Jesus showed us on the cross, isn't it? And that's exactly the, the point of the next couple of verses. Why don't you take those up from sure. verse 5 where it takes this principle of humility and putting aside pride and draws us directly to a look at the Lord Jesus. As, as well as tying us back to Genesis where Eve made her mistake. We read in verse 5 of Philippians 2, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now the word robbery here is not a real good translation. The word robbery here is he thought it not something to be grasped, is is the word robbery, to be equal with God. As Eve thought it something to be grasped, to be as the gods having her eyes opened, and seeking that wisdom that the serpent said, you shall have your eyes open and be as the gods. But Jesus didn't think that, although he had the mind of God through his education as a child in the Old Testament. And it goes on to say, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So he, he continuously condescended to us of low estate to the lowest common denominator of being called a criminal and then being crucified with that lowest form of Roman execution crucifixion. And so what we have then is, uh, and we've talked about it before, is the example of Jesus, the example of perfect living, setting aside pride of life for us to look at. And it shouldn't surprise us that today we find that um, around us and our own human nature is no different. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Good one. And a reminder here that just prior to the return of Christ, that we can expect to find the same kind of issues that we're dealing with um, every single day. All around us. 2 Timothy 3 at verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of stress. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, slanderers, profligates, fierce haters of goods, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and holding the form of religious, but religion, but denying the power of it. Avoid such people. And while this is a seems like a very negative uh, mm-hmm. set of issues to deal with, it really is what we're talking about. You see, a lot of religious people don't really understand that having a form of godliness is what religion's all about. Everyone's religious about something, but a form of godliness and denying the power, we need to turn away from that. And the whole point is by I believe in my own personal life, when I ran into the Christadelphians and I was a long-haired hippie and I was drug-crazed, as somebody thought, many people thought, I guess, but it was the word and cleansing my mind of those imaginary thoughts and fearful thoughts by replacing those thoughts with the thoughts of God on a continuous daily basis. And that's what we all have to do is read the word of God. We might profess godliness, but if we're not reading his word daily with our family, we're not bonding together and holding that integrity of the glue of God's word in our minds and obeying it like we should. Reading it, studying it, developing the power of godliness and not just having a form. There's a lot of form out there in the mm-hmm. form of religion. Absolutely. So let's take a final look then at 1 John chapter 2, verse right. 15. Because this is the verse that's been our theme through mm-hmm. all four of our classes. Right. And we would encourage our, uh, those who are listening in on this fourth class, if you hadn't had a chance to listen to the first three classes, it would really be helpful to do that. Mm-hmm. In 1 John 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. 
Anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And that's mm-hmm. the message to us, is to do away with these things of the world because they are going to pass away they are. one way or the other. And um, what will be left is the will of God. That's right. When the Lord Jesus is on this earth, his kingdom has been established, and God's glory is throughout the earth. And we want to do that. It, it certainly will. Stan, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, you for helping us put together these four discussions. It's been a pleasure. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, go to www.thisisyourbible.com, click on the Library tab, and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, The Christadelphians. In addition to our library, thisisyourbible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about His future kingdom on the earth.